<laughs> Congratulations on your institutional recognition from Ched. I was joking the Ched people who were my previous colleagues. Sabi ko, uy, regulatory daw kayo. <laughs> Kailangan nyo ng magbago. But I think... <laughs> No, pero to be honest, when we were in CHED, and of course there were many debates about institutions like UMAC and PLM, laging, yes, walang institutional recognition from CHED, but we know that they're better than, than many HEIs that actually have recognition. And so it was very difficult to actually categorize you, no? Because we knew you were excellent, and we knew you were so employ em focused on employability, industry um, connected, and it was something that we aspired for for so many higher education institutions, and yet we did not know how to categorize. And so now, with an institu institutional recognition, it really facilitates many more conversations, collaborations with CHED, and I hope it really does bring you, Mac, to even greater heights than you already have achieved. Um, before I begin, I because I'm from EDCOM too, and we are working closely with Dr. X, but I wanted to ask how many of you actually know about EDCOM and what we are doing? Mm. <laughs> si <Ma. laughs> <Nagdalawang> speech ka <laughs> <kanina>, ma'am. <laughs> what is EDCOM? <laughs> Sino sa inyo na about EDCOM? Okay. Tatlo pa lang, four. Okay. Ah, yes. <laughs> Friends kami. <laughs> huh? You're updated. Na update ka pala, ma'am. So what is EDCOM? <laughs> <laughs> Nako, grade 3 learner natin po, parang ganyan. <laughs> so EDCOM, I'll explain later, but a lot of people ask us, are you with DepEd? Are you reporting to VP Sara or with CHED? Hindi po kami doon and I'll clarify later. Um, the next question I have is, are we in a learning crisis? Sino nagsasabing yes? Okay. Sino nagsasabing no? Wala. What does a learning crisis mean? What does being in a learning crisis mean? Dito po ako sa may likod. <laughs> Umuo kayo <yung> lahat. <laughs> Walang nag-no. Oh, sino po magsasa Sino makakasagot? What does a learning crisis mean? What does it say about our learners? Walang tumitingin sa akin sa mata. <laughs> Dito po sa row na to. Hi, ma'am. <laughs> what does having a learning crisis in our country mean? And why is it a big problem? Mismatch in terms of what is not matching. Education and the skills that they have and what they need in the workplace. Okay. Then if I ask you, what do you think is the biggest problem in higher education today in the Philippines? If there is one thing that is the biggest problem that if you were going to give us an assignment in EDCOM, we should fix in the next three years, what is that? Si ma'am narinig ko may sinasabi kanina. Overload. Sino yung overload? Yung teacher, yung student? Parehas. Parehas. Pero hindi mo ba nag-revise na yung PSGs ng CHED? After K-12, to para daw mabawasan ng units. So, paano kaya natin pwedeng gawin yun? So, overloaded ang teachers, overloaded ang students, pero may mismatch sa kailangan ng skills. Bakit ganun? Maybe the competencies that being required is not clear. By CHED. Dapat po sinabi natin kanina. <laughs> Minsan po, when we have the opportunity, let's say it. No, just kidding. Sige, I'll start. Do I have a clicker or do, will I just say next slide? Sige, next slide na lang. Um, EDCOM 2 was passed into law in July of 2022 and we have a three-year mandate. It is to conduct a comprehensive national assessment and evaluation of the problems of Philippine education. And pag sinabi po natin Philippine education, napakalawak ng mandato namin. This is to review problems in early childhood education, pre-kinder, from zero to four years old, and all the way until higher education and even lifelong learning. So even graduate studies, upskilling and reskilling opportunities, even if you are much older, you are still a learner. And are there opportunities for you? Or are there not? And what should we do about it? 
Next slide. Because we are a congressional commission, my commissioners are actually legislators, and I have 10, five from the Senate and five from the House. Sila po yung mga committee chairpersons ng basic and higher and technical education from both sides of Congress. So uh, we have Senator Wynne, Kong Roman, Kong Mark, and then other members of the commission who have long experiences and track records in supporting education reform. Si Senator Joel, Senator Sunny, Kong Kiko, who was previously president of Philippine Women's University and is now Congressman of Negros, Kong Khalid, Kong PJ, Senator Pia, Senator Cheese. So we have 10 legislators na ang trabaho is to understand with us the problems of Philippine education, particularly for the Standing Committee on Higher Education, in which Professor X is part of a Standing Committee member representing the concerns of local universities and colleges. It is co-chaired by Senator Cheese Escudero and Kong Mark Go, kasi po sila yung chair sa House and sa Senate. Next slide. We also have members of the Advisory Council with us. So we have Father Ben Nebres. Siya po yung natitirang EDCOM 1 member na nasa EDCOM 2 pa rin. Um, Dr. Sinch Bautista, previously Commissioner of CHED and also Vice President of UP. We also have representatives of industry. Kasi po, nauunawaan ng mga mambabatas na hindi pwedeng edukasyon lang iisipin natin pero hindi naman related sa mga trabahong available pagka-graduate. And so we have members from industry, local government, civil society, and also other government agencies. Next slide. It's an EDCOM 2 because there was an EDCOM 1. Next slide. Sino pong nakakaalala ng EDCOM 1? Hmm? Lalo na daw wala pa. <laughs> Next slide. Si Sir naalala. Next slide. Sino po sa inyo yung nakakakilala sa mga taong nasa picture na to? Ayan. Oo, si Senator Angara. I think this one is Bagaching or someone. <laughs> Carlos Padilla. So, EDCOM 1 happened in the 1990s. Kung naalala po natin yung Department of Education, Culture, and Sports, DEX, it was the Ministry of Education that was then studied by the first EDCOM. And after EDCOM conducted its comprehensive review of the problems of Philippine education post-1980s, it recommended the trifocalization of education to three agencies. So, next slide. It proposed the creation of DepEd, of CHED, of TESDA. It proposed the Teacher Professionalization Act of 1994, na nagiging basis natin for the licensure examination for teachers. It proposed the Moder Modernization Act of PRC also. It proposed the Teacher Education Council to ensure that we improve the quality of our teaching force. So marami pong the architecture of our education today as system today as we know it was really designed following the recommendations of the first EDCOM in the 1990s. And because the legislators felt that 30 years after we are in such big trouble because of the learning crisis that we needed an extraordinary effort to reform things from a systems level and not piecemeal. Because on a year-to-year -year basis, of course, there are efforts. There's DepEd, there's CHEB, there's TESDA. There's TESDA. Pero sometimes hindi po nagtutugma or nagdidikit-dikit yung mga reforms. Ang sabi ko nga, in our hearing last week with most of these agencies, it's only one learner who goes from ECCD Council, na mag attend ng DepEd, mag attend ng CHED. But what they face, the realities, and what they are taught are so different and sometimes incoherent. It is one learner, but they are not supported as they go through the entire system. Minsan, they fall through the cracks pa because may mga potholes that no one is minding. And across those, bridge, and across those gaps, there are no bridges and there is no one minding it. And that is our role to find where the gaps are, to fill them, and to make sure that we are able to create the ladders and the bridges where they do not exist. Next slide. Ito po yung mga batas na sinabi ko kanina that was um, proposed by the first EDCOM. Next slide. Naalala niyo po yung title ng libro kanina ng EDCOM 1, Making Education Work. And I guess our question is, did we get to make education work after 1993? 30 years after, are we now better off than before? Where are we today? Most of the things I will present to you will be in higher education, but I wanted to share with you two insights that even to me,
was very striking and I worked in the education policy space, policy space for a very long time. So I wanted to share it with you. Next slide. Malnutrition and stunting is a big problem of the country. Majority of our children are malnourished and stunted and we have one of the highest rates in the world. Inaral po namin siya from conception. So these are nutritionally at risk mothers, meaning malnourished girls, women, getting pregnant, conceiving, bearing a child, and its impact on the child. And then you have zero to six months, seven to 24 months. Ito po yung tinatawag natin na first 1,000 days. And then two to three years old, three to four years old, and then kinder. So five years old. Sino pong mga ina dito? Mga may anak. Yan. You know, there are many feeding programs all over the country. And a lot of organizations donate for nutrition and feeding programs. But the literature tells us that if you feed them or if you, you provide them food when they are already in grade 5, grade 6, it will no longer help them strengthen their cognitive functions because those are developed in the first 1,000 days of life. Dito po. Upon conception until 24 months, what we did was to map out what we are investing in as a government and how many children we are supporting. We found that only 12-13% of nutritionally at risk mothers are getting nourishment support. Almost 90% malnourished. At sila malnourished sila, pag nanganak sila, mag-breastfeeding man sila. Wala silang naipapasang nutrients sa mga anak nila. Yung first 1,000 days po natin, 60% of our mothers in the Philippines are exclusively breastfeeding. But 40% do not. What happens to the 40%? And there are many reasons for this. Minsan, the mom is not home. Nag OFW. Minsan, wala sa kanyang bayan kasi nagkasambahay, nagtatrabaho sa ibang lugar sa Pilipinas. Minsan, hindi talaga niya kaya. Maraming constraints. But how are we serving them and that 40%? When it comes to 7 to 24 months, lalo pang lumaki, 58%. And the data shows that the stunting uh, prevalence diverges in terms of prevalence or likelihood between the rich and the poor beginning 7 months. So pag ikaw mahirap, talagang taas, bubulusok pataas yung stunting rate mo at 7 months and it stays there until you get old. So I'm telling people now and I'm telling you, if you have children, if you have grandchildren, pag may pamangkin kayo, or if you're participating in any nutrition or feeding programs, if you need to prioritize, do it here. Because when you do it here, you improve the chances of the child to really um, fu fully develop their cognitive functions and improve their performance in school, improve their health, improve their life outcomes later on in life. When you get beyond this, it is irreversible. The damage has been done. Even if you keep feeding them, maging obese man yan pagtanda, hindi na yan kayang bumalik sa pwede niya sanang ma-develop nung unang mga buwan. So please, spread the word because not a lot of people seem to know. Next slide. There's a learning gap of 5.5 years. And when we speak of the learning crisis in general, most people would refer to this problem. What is a learning gap of 5.5 years? It means to say that our children are in school for 13 years, but when the actual learning is checked, it's 13 minus 5.5. Nasana kung natuto sila ng maayos, nakasave sana ng 5.5 years yung estudyante. Hindi na lang sila pumasok kasi wala naman silang natutunan. So nag-extend tayo ng schooling in terms of number of years, but in terms of learning, it is not happening. So quality sometimes over quantity. When we looked at countries all over the world, Africa has much fewer years of schooling than we. Pero pantay lang tayo in terms of learning. Kasi mas natututo sila in fewer years. Tayo nasa school, pero walang nangyayari. And I wanted to highlight that this is, that there are variances. 
yung top 20% natin, so the, these shaded figures refer to those who have below basic proficiency. Ibig sabihin talagang yung basic hindi niya makaya. This is reading. 55% of the top 20% in terms of household income. Kalahate, kahit mayaman, below basic proficiency. So hindi lamang to a public school problem or a poor problem. It's a problem we all have. Because even those who have the most access to resources and the best schools, kalahate, below basic proficiency. But in the bottom 20%, this is almost 100%. Pagdating po sa by school type, in public schools, this is 85%. Private independent schools, meaning those, private dependent, meaning those that are dependent on government scholarships or voucher programs, 77%. And those that are not dependent, kalahati pa rin. It means to say that the problem of learning learning crisis, the lack of basic proficiencies. We all share it. Our students all have it. And we need to work hard to make sure that we're able to build those foundational competencies. Because kung wala yun, and in the hearing I also mentioned nga, you know, education is a basic human right, but it is also an enabling right. Because kung wala ka, especially in the first grades, kinder, grades one, grade two, grade three, if you don't develop numeracy, the ability to add simple numbers, or literacy to read and to be able to comprehend texts, you could not learn anything else above that. Even if you have the most sophisticated universities, even if you have all the scholarships in the world, if you don't have those foundations, everything else will be for naught. So we have to mobilize amongst ourselves because Marami pong graduates natin, and maybe many of our students also have this problem still. Kita-kita po natin yun. And even in our day-to-day -day lives, we see it. Basic things, nagkakamali talaga. Bumabalik po sa foundational skills. Next slide. So, trends and issues in higher education. And I chose just five. Next slide. Access to quality, higher education, narrowed in the last decade. So I looked at data from 2010 to 2018. Yung, you know, in, I'm not sure if you're familiar. I'm, I'm sure maybe you are. Yung sa private po, autonomous deregulated, yung highest quality private institutions. In, in SUCs, SOC level 4. So yun po yung datos. Kasi sa LUCs, wala. Walang similar tiering na available. And so I was unable to do that there. But what I checked was, we expanded access to higher education. Tumaas po yung participation rate natin and we're about 40%. That's good. One of the highest also based on our income class. But access to quality, meaning to say, who had access to good quality institutions in terms of proportion from 2010 to 2018? What do we see? Do we have the skills, <laughs> may competencies tayo to assess charts? <laughs> Or wala pala. <laughs> Ang part po ng talk ko po, ipapadala ko dito yung mga PISA exam, ipapatay ko po sa inyo. <laughs> I-check natin if you will fare better than our learners. <laughs> what do you see? What color should we look at is most striking to you? Huh? Sigaw po. Purple. It expanded from 33%. To 41%. That is SUCs and LUCs in general. Yung hindi level 4. Yung level 4, yung access to the top quality SUCs, stagnant. 6 to 7% in the past decade. Nandito po. Sinama ko sa 7%. Ang autonomous deregulated bumagsak from 26 percentage points to 18%. So what happened? The profile of learners shifted. A lot left or disappeared from private autonomous deregulated, our best quality private institutions, and transferred to SUCs and LUCs that are not of the best quality. That is what happened in the past decade. But obviously, quality here is narrowly defined. 
Again, it is defined in terms of inputs, which is what autonomous regulated. Most, most metrics are still inputs, although it tries to weave in some outcomes. Pero maybe we should ask ourselves, how should we define quality? And in LUCs, and this is a question that we will ask, what is quality in LUCs? How do we make sure or gauge quality across the 140 that uh, they mentioned, that Ched mentioned earlier? And how do we encourage all of them to become access to quality and not just access alone? Next slide. College graduates dominate TVET graduates in recent years. Meaning to say, yung gumagraduate po ng TVET, hindi na high school grads yung nagtitivet po. College graduates sila, nagtetekvo courses, nage NC1, NC2. Bakit kaya? Some of them maybe need hard skills. Some of them need a certain certification to get into a certain job or to go abroad. But what does it mean also of us and the college degrees that we give? That either it is not matched to the opportunities out there, or that it does not give them the hard skills that can get them hired in the positions they are looking for. And that is a point for reflection for us. Why is this happening? It's good that they are pursuing skilling opportunities, but why is it that their college degree did not give them those skills? Next slide. Returns to higher education have declined substantially by 28 to 30, 36 percentage points between 2005 and 2019. Yung returns to college education is what you get as outcome in the labor market in terms of wages after you graduate, three to five years. That's what I compared. Kumpara siya sa isang estudyante na nag-drop out elementary pa lang. So dati po, from 2001 to 2010, a college graduate could earn up to 183% more than someone who did not finish any level of education. The trend was going up until 2010. Ngayong 2019, pabagsak na po siya. Meaning to say the value of a college degree is going down. Because we have an oversupply and maybe there are concentrations of college graduates only in specific industries or fields. Pare-parehas na yung mga graduates natin. Pare-parehong courses ang tinitake, pare-parehong industries at jobs ang ina-applyan, and therefore companies can pay less because their demand is lower. Next slide. The sharpest fall happened for those in the services sector. 65.9 percentage points. Nakita niyo po kung ganong kalaki ang bagsak? Almost nasa 90% na lang yung agwat niya sa isang nag-drop out nung elementary. That is a huge, huge drop. And that will change the profile and maybe the interest of many students to pursuing college. It should also wake us up in higher education. Why are we seemingly, at least based on data, streaming everyone towards the services sector? What we've found is that during those years, agriculture and manufacturing returns have remained stable, and there is still demand there. Are there college graduates that are being trained for that sector? What jobs or courses would those be? We need to find out. This is most pronounced for women. Kasi mas marami pong women graduates. Kasi mas, matag mas mataas talaga yung level of attainment ng mga kababaihan. Yung mga girls daw po sa Pilipinas, sila yung pinag i ng pamilya ng edukasyon. Sa bata daw, ipapamana ang lupa or yung bahay sa anak na babae pag-aaralin. Next slide. Access to quality education remains limited and concentrated in specific regions. Pag tinignan po natin yung datos, karamihan nasa Manila, Davao, Cebu, nandoon. But beyond our, our, where we are, access to quality is really poor. And that is partly Ched's role also. To proactively nurture centers of excellence, to make sure that wherever you are, there is access to quality. And not just transferring to Manila or Cebu or Davao. Next slide. 
licensure examination passing remains low. I heard that sa inyo, that's not your problem. But for many HEIs, it is. I had the meeting with PRC two days ago. Sabi ko, obviously, there's something that we need to rethink, no? Kasi for teachers, for example, top profession, one of the top courses in terms of applications for college, teaching talaga, teacher education. But yung passing rate natin, in the past decade, 30 to 40 percent. Meaning to say, and daming pinag-aaral ng pera ng bayan na afterwards would not even pass the licensure, would not even practice the profession and become a teacher. And kailangan natin ng magagaling na teacher. So why is that the case? And the <clears throat> passing rate average, and this is a poor metric of quality actually, kasi ang nagtitake lang ng licensure exam yung gustong magtake. Tapos average pa to across all courses. But about half don't make it after finishing a diploma. So actually, you're lucky because that's not a problem of your graduates, but many of our graduates might be finishing with diplomas that are just paper and have no real value in terms of preparing them for the workforce or giving them the aptitude to actually pass licensure examinations for their professions. This is a crime. This is something that we should hold universities accountable for also. Next slide. Yung kabalintunaan dito, or the irony of it, is that while we are all over the place in terms of supporting access to higher education, I mean, it's good. We have the support, we have the resources. Many more could now enter SUCs, LUCs, and even private. But contrast that to the reality that there are many professions where we have huge deficits for. In 2017 and 2018, I did studies on healthcare professionals. Yung deficit natin for doctors is 60,000. Yung nag-graduate po every year, 3,000. So wala na po tayong lahat sa buhay na ito. Hindi pa rin tayo, hindi pa natin napupunan yung deficit natin sa doctors. And most medical schools are private. So why not public institutions, considering that it is government funds investing, and it is government that has a universal health care law. Because even if you have that law, if there are no doctors to serve, then who do you see? And we're talking about doctors in general, not even specialization. So kung may rayuma po tayo, kung meron po tayo hypertension, yung mga cardiologist, oncologist, Iba pa po yun. Hindi pa natin binilang yun. Pero kulang din po yun. As, some of, as many of you would know. For dentistry, our deficit is at, is at 52,000. Ilan yung nagtake in 2017? 3,498. Again, malayu po. And then for pharmacy, there are only 101 HEIs out of 2,400 offering pharmacy. And there are regions in the country without a single pharmacy program. Region 5, Mimaropa, Caraga, and Barm. Paano po kaya ang mga mercury drug at Watsons doon? <laughs> Mahirap po siguro magkasakit. <laughs> so, we have to plan human resource for our country better. And sometimes, yes, we could wait, wait for government to come together I wish, NEDA, DOST, CHED can sit down, PRC, where do we need it, what region, what municipality, what province. But more, more likely than not, it might not happen. But we are here. Universities exist and are in their communities. It is really just having a pulse on the ground to understand what does my community need? What professionals are we lacking? Kung tayo lahat taga Makati, ano yung kulang nating specialist? Hindi kaya dapat doon tayo mag-invest. And if I were a university in another province, that will also be my question for myself. I was in Zamboanga before. Sabi ko doon sa, ano ba, my center of excellence in fisheries. Sabi ko, ano pong nangyayari sa fisheries program natin? Ah, sir, baba na po ng enrollment. Talagang pabagsak ng pabagsak. Last year, lima lang po yung graduates namin. Sabi ko, lima lang. But you're a center of excellence. You should be attracting, no? And you should be pushing the frontiers in terms of fisheries for Region 9. What happens to your graduates? Sabi nung dean, 
Ay, sir, hindi ko po alam. Kaya pala. <laughs> if you don't know what industry needs, if you don't know where your graduates are going, if you don't ask what competencies they are lacking and they want to learn, how do you make sure that your program is responsive to the available jobs and opportunities and the needs of your community? Kaya sa akin, let's not depend on agencies of government to do the heavy lifting in terms of being responsive. We are here. We are professionals. We are smart. We have tools. We are from our communities. Let's ask the question ourselves. We have links to the communities. We all have emails. We all have cell phones. Magtawag tayo, magtanong. Hindi tayo pwedeng maghintay na bumagsak galing sa taas. Please offer these programs. I mean, that's ideal, but it should not just come from the top. We could do our share in finding that out. Next slide. I guess I'll try to go through this quickly. In all over the world, a college degree, and even in the Philippines, there is, there is a strong uh, attachment to a college degree because of its equalizing power. What does it mean? Mahirap ka man o mayaman pag makatungtong ka ng kolehyo at nagkaroon ka ng diploma, parehas na tayo ng opportunities after we graduate. We are both college graduates. Whether we are rich or poor, we are one and the same, and we are both competitive. We have access to equal opportunities and outcomes in the labor market. Ang tanong ko po, because this was part of my PhD thesis, is this the case in the Philippines today? What do you think? In Makati, eh? si ma'am, Miss Ms. Logan. <laughs> Comms officer po kayo, <laughs> na joke lang. <laughs> no, yes, yes you are. Yes, you are. I checked your data. You are. But for the most part, let's see. Next slide. So ang tanong ko po, does it matter where you go? Parang are, are college degrees equal? If you go to a high status public, so yung SOC level 4, and actually sinama ko po kayo sa SOC level 4 dito sa high status public because I knew of UMAC and PLM, sinama ko po kayo dito, High status non-profit, yung mga autonomous deregulated. So ito yung mga religious universities, ito yung hindi. Um, tapos regular HEIs, yung walang recognition from CHET. Next slide. Ito po yun. Yung college and higher, ito po yung mga magulang na mas nakakaigi sa buhay. Um, orange po yung line. Yung blue are those that have less education. What does it show us? If you go to a regular university that is, does not have status, may agwat po yung outcomes mo in life. Three to five years after graduation. But if you go to a high status public, whether you are rich or poor, it is equal. The same is true for high status nonprofit like Ateneo, La Salle, Saints Co. Nandito po sila. But if you go to a non-high status institution, a regular university, if you are poor, your outcomes in life and your trajectory will be different from those that are advantaged. Next slide. Who is most likely to reach middle income? Ito po. Itong dalawa ulit. High status public and high status non-profit. If you go to a regular university, it is less likely, only 30% of them reach middle income. Next slide. Kamusta po tayo? So that is where we are in terms of higher education. You are doing a good job as UMAC. You are giving social mobility to your graduates. But in terms of moving yourself forward, we cannot stay stagnant. We need to keep looking and assessing whether our graduates are still getting those outcomes in the coming years. And if not, how do we pivot? How do we continuously evolve to make sure that they are ahead of the pack and we give them the quality of education, but also the outcomes, the equalizing power that they deserve? In EDCOM, as I mentioned earlier, our concerns are more than just higher ed kasi buong span po yung tinitingnan namin. Next slide. So we're looking at 28 priorities, going from nutrition and feeding 
to early childhood, to higher education. Next slide. Teacher ed, TVET, and lifelong learning. Next slide. So, napakarami. Pinakita ko lang po. <laughs> Next slide. In higher education, I'll just share what our priorities are. And tingnan natin kung nagtutugma doon sa sinabi nila na overloaded daw ang teachers at ang estudyante. So, our issues include access to quality higher education. How do we improve the developmental and regulatory capacity of CHED to ensure quality in all HEIs? The next is ensuring closer coordination between industry and academe, so check. Harmonizing the Philippine Qualifications Framework and the Philippine Skills Framework na ngayon magkaiba pa, kailangan pagtabihin, and improving access to quality of higher ed. Meron din po tayong tinitingnan na framework for the establishment and sustainability of HEIs, especially LUCs. We all know that after RA 10931, parami po nang parami ang LUCs na natatayo. That will be, ano ba, it's, it can be a problem, especially if there is no clear framework that delineates their role in their communities versus SUCs versus private versus small, big, medium type of universities. Kasi kung lahat tayo university, lahat mag-o-offer ng PhDs, masters, research degrees, maghihingi ng funds for research, magta-try mag-publish, we will not get anywhere. We need to understand our unique mission in our communities and our unique role in the higher education landscape because it is not all the same. And then we're also looking at complementarity between public and private. Next slide. We're looking at graduate education, research and innovation. You know, in other countries, the basis of quality undergraduate education is that their faculty members do the research, you know, and the frontiers of their disciplines, and then they teach it in their class. Ang sinishare po nila, mga research publications nila, na lalabas pa lang or kakalabas lang, and sila mismo may mga tanong, and then they involve the students to ask these same questions or to work with them in their research para mahasa yung research skills ng mga estudyante. They sit down together, give each other readings, ask questions, allow themselves to be questioned. The foundation of quality higher education is a strong graduate education. And that is still something that is maybe 10 years from now for many, for us, for us in general. Um, we are also looking at digital transformation and education technologies as well as internationalization. But this is year two. Next slide. So how can we expand higher education opportunities while supporting national development? We don't exist in a vacuum. We have responsibilities to our learners. We have responsibilities to our community and also to our country. Because the role of universities ever since has not just been to be nice places to do research. It is to train a high quality uh, graduate, and it is also to advance technologies. In the context of developing countries like the Philippines, it is also to build a strong teaching workforce. Because yun yung ambag natin to a quality basic education. Those three are our missions. Next slide. So I just pose a few questions. How do we improve access to quality? Maybe in the context of LUCs, especially Dr. X is part of our standing committee, this is a question that we have, particularly for LUCs. How can I have a category for LUCs that when I do my chart again, I, I could say access to quality LUCs expanded in the past decade? We want to be able to say that because currently it is not even in the chart. How do we make sure that we are improving the social mobility of our graduates? Gumawa tayo ng graduate tracer studies, aralin natin, not just are they employed, but what is the quality of employment? How much are they earning? How, is it, how are they faring compared to other graduates? What could we get them a higher salary? How could we get them there? What other competencies could we build to distinguish them further? Are we sufficiently exploring opportunities and needs in agriculture and manufacturing? Also, sometimes, ito, ito po personally pinupush ko, sometimes we always say, industry academy mismatch. Let's talk to industry. But sometimes we also need to talk to our learners. What do you want ba? 
what direction do you wish to take? Kasi baka offer tayo ng offer ng course na gusto ng industry, pero hindi naman akma sa gusto ng mga learners natin. We need to be learner-centered, not just in our classrooms, but also in the design of our schools at how we plan. Let's consult our students. Let's talk to high school students. Yun po yung mga gagawin na namin ngayon. In the context of complementarity, how do public institutions differ from private? Next slide. In which priority areas should you focus on? If you have scholarships, what should you, where should you give it? What disciplines? What programs? And sana match sa needs ninyo. Hindi yung kung saan na lang gusto mag-enroll. What, because we have limited resources, kung mag-build tayo ng capacity for research, saan? Hindi pwede po kasi yung research funds distributed equally across all disciplines because we will never get there given the amount of resources we have. We need to invest strategically in those that could really fuel advancements in our country. Otherwise, lahat po tayo bagsak. Sabi nga ni dating president ng UP, Fred Pascualo, is now DTI secretary, it's all of us hugging each other at the bottom, not letting anyone rise up. At least for board professions, how do we make sure we have enough supply? And then finally, of course, a lot of your graduates are also employable abroad. How do we make sure that we have a good balance of those who go abroad and those who stay given national needs? Do we track the percentage of graduates across courses that go abroad and stay here? How do we balance it if we see that most of them are abroad-oriented? So these are questions that I want to just pose to you. I don't have the answers, but these are the questions we are asking ourselves. And in the course of the next three years, as we do our job, we hope to propose policies and programs that would give us the answers to this and maybe a good balance and hopefully a more efficient and effective and quality and accessible higher education system for the next generation. Salamat po. Thank you, Dr. Yi. Thank you, Dr. Yi, for you know, giving us a clearer picture of what EdCom is all about and uh, giving us those guide questions that we can use uh, you know, to, to, to reach our goal as an institution. So now, uh, kindly uh, sit back and relax. Uh, may we call member of HR? Um, may I have the questions? If you have questions to our speaker, Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Yi, for that excellent presentation. Um, I had a lot of realizations based on the data that you presented, no? but these are hardly new. And I guess many of us have been navigating through this uh, higher education uh, university for quite some time now. Uh, can relate one way or the other with... with um, major issues, no? But I think what stands out would be the problem that we associate with standardization, no? Sayang, wala na yung chid, eh. Dapat nagparinig tayo. Incidentally, parang while we recognize that standardization and a one-size-fits-all approach seems to be problematic at the very least, our policy responses has been completely to perpetuate this this formula of standardization. So, parang in my own research and what you presented, there are universities, there are colleges, and we each have our roles, but everybody wants to aim to be universities. And you cannot really blame uh, institutions to be like that, and you also cannot blame individuals for aspiring to, you know, play in that same system, no? We can look at it both at the institutional and even at the personal level. For example, promotion. When we speak of promotion, everybody wants to be full professor, di ba? Everybody wants to be full professor, everybody wants to publish, everybody, but we have to face the reality. There are better teachers, but they're not necessarily uh, good researchers. But the formula that we follow in assigning professorial ranks 
which incidentally carries with it higher pay, yun lang naman talagang bottom line doon, <laughs> is still geared towards um, research output. I mean, we, we want to be molded into such kind of uh, um, level as our teachers, in other words. So the question is, I don't know, I, I think um, our president has, has given us updates on what EDCOM is doing, but I am not sure if there is a conscious recognition on the part of the EDCOM that standardization is problematic. No, uh, I was also looking at the COD, COE, Maybe skewed talaga yung policy responses kasi maybe there, I don't know, I was just telling Attorney Jewel, maybe it's a chicken and egg question. Baka sila kaya excellent sila, that's why they were given the COE by Chedis because they're very good in the first place. But but what about those who, who need it the most? So, um, I don't know if you're already doing that. Yung bang tipong, you can still participate in the industry of knowledge creation get the same level of pay as a full professor, for example, in, in a top-performing university, but continue to, uh, I mean, do your share as maybe as a teacher in a local university in, um, in Abra or wherever. Mga ganon. So I don't know if, if, if I make sense in my question, Dr. but thank you very much. No, thank you for that question. Um, I will wash my hands a bit. <laughs> I was in CHED for five years. When I was in CHED, I headed the K-12 transition program. And when we designed the grant for institutional development and innovation, we were conscious in building different tracks. One grant will be 10 million, but for research-oriented big universities who have the readiness for that. But usually, kasi it stops there. What we did was to create different categories that if you are not yet at that level, and you want to build capacity, you are not excluded. You could apply for the 5 million grant also to get to you to the next level in the future, the 10 million. In the conversations within EDCOM, it is very clear that the one-size-fits-all does not work. We need to diversify pathways to excellence because autonomy, the regulation, and excellence and development, COEs, CODs, should not just conform to the university type of the research university model. Kasi ngayon, unintendedly maybe, everyone is being forced to become a research university because what is being required of you, PhDs, peer-reviewed journal publications, what if you're responding to the needs of industry and the call for you in your disciplines that you're offering is not that then you could never reach these standards. So it's really a big problem. And that is something that we are actively discussing. The problem also, the problem naman with that is it is tied to a very, ano ba, to a word that has a lot of baggage, which is typology. Because, but that is what it is. We need to typologize. We need to create a mechanism to cluster ourselves and ang, ang sinasabi ko nga, we should not be afraid of it. And maybe, but maybe we should change the name and not use that word. Because it means to say, for example, for the other LUCs, then you should not be forced to have all of your faculty with PhDs. They should not be asked to have research publications. Instead, collaborate with industry. Develop programs that respond to industry. Design quality programs, applications, projects that allow you to problem solve, to support the work of industry and train them for what companies need. And then by having that, you could be a center of excellence, for example, in engineering, in manufacturing, in agriculture systems, parang ganyan. Hindi yung, eh, wala ka namang publication eh. Yung faculty mo, yung percentage ng PhD, wala dyan. It should not be like that because whatever type you have, there should be a corresponding COE, COD criteria that suits you. There should also be a corresponding grant that suits you. Kasi kung ganyan yung gagawin natin, tapos ang i-offer lang naman lagi, research grants, research grants, research grants, then how do you build partnerships with industry if there are no supports there? What are the incentives? So yun yung mga bagay na kailangan buuin. We should not I mean, I'm sure people are scared of the word typology, but it comes with a lot of benefits. It democratizes access to resources. It allows government to treat you differently, meaning to say, pwede kayong gawa ng plantilla positions for specific um, 
position. For example, in other countries, there are professors of practice. And if you are an industry-driven organization, university, and you connect with them a lot, wala nga kayong research positions na plantilla, pero kay meron kayong positions for professors of practice. So you could afford practitioners to work with you. Yeah, so hindi siya, hindi siya, if you don't hit a research university pathway, you are no longer excellent and you will have less resources. You will have similar access to resources or even more access to resources because then it now conforms to your mandate and mission. And that is what we want to build through EDCOM. That is what we want to propose because we have long, long, long parang put ourselves in a straight jacket of a research university that honestly is not appropriate to our level as a country. That is a very Western conception that is not responsive to our needs as a country. And we need to think of things differently. That's my answer. So please help us. Of the measures for yes, the yes. entry requirement for a faculty member. Yes. Enters. So, pero lahat yun. And also for DBM also. Yes. Yes. Lahat yun. So, kausap namin, ang kinakausap namin ngayon, NEDA, DBM, GPPB, COA, lahat ng agencies na hindi DepEd Ched test na lang because the problems of government naman or ed education is not just DepEd Ched test na. Napakaraming limitations from outside of government that are not set by the three education agencies that really also hinder us from doing our work well. So, but before we engage CSC, dapat malinaw na sa atin, ano yung typology? Kasi then we will say, ito na yung dapat yung positions, ito dapat yung level. And then sa DBM, ito naman dapat yung position classification scheme natin. Diba? In the same way na sa DepEd, sa public schools, yung EDCOM 1, nag-recommend, dati po kasi, to become a principal, isang track lang kayo mula teacher hanggang principal. So para ma-promote lahat, kailangan maging principal. So ang ginawa nila, pinagdalawa. You could be a master teacher and never aspire to be principal, but keep getting promoted and get the same level. We need to do that, but for different types of institutions, for higher education. So that's what we are studying. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, sir. We have a question from our audience. Is there a need for CHED and TESDA collaboration to improve the employment status of our college graduates? Well, yung TESDA po wala namang role sa college graduates. Um, but in general, I think there is a need to collaborate better across agencies. Kasi, I mean, there are many, it's hard kasi in government po, people, agencies, and you know, you might, I'm not sure if you see this, but maybe you also experience it. Agencies are so undermanned. Inaral po namin, yung budget po ng CHED, from 4 billion, naging 30 billion in the past 10 years, pero yung plantilla positions, konti lang yung nadagdag. Meaning to say, yung people who do the jobs, tumriple, ilang beses na, na exponentially umakyat yung workload nila, pero hindi sila nadagdagan ng tao. It, it makes coordination difficult if your responsibilities keep growing, but the number of people to do it, you don't have. But ideally, we have stronger mechanisms with Dole, for example, kasi meron silang jobs fit. May LMI sila that tells you these are the jobs that we need um, graduates for. There are ways to do it more closely, but because I think of um, the problem of being undermanned, it's really difficult. So structurally, we are also looking at those issues. When we say right-sizing, it means conforming the number of personnel you have to your mandate. Ever since the, ever since, um, the last RAT plan of CHED in 2013, there are 11 laws that added responsibilities to CHED, but not people. And so now we are studying that and then assessing how could we make it better? How could we improve things? And then we hold, at that point, then you ask for targets and hold them accountable because you gave them the resources to do their job. Because sa akin, you cannot say, oh, mag performance based management tayo. Tingnan natin yung mga targets, i assess natin, i monitor natin sila. Pero wala namang resources, wala namang tao, wala namang tulong. Mahirap namang gawin yun. It has to be realistic. 
Another question, sir. <clears throat> Good morning, sir. I really would like to thank EDCOM because we can see a ray of sunshine coming <laughs> based you. on your initiatives. Um, when I ask my students in the graduate school, particularly those who are working in DepEd, sabi ko, anong problema ba talaga? Kasi parang ang gagaling nyo. Ang mga estudyante ko sa DepEd, pag tinanong mo, skills-wise, ang gagaling nila, alam nila ang trabaho nila. Pero isa sa problema nila is, yung paiba-ibang practices, paiba-ibang curriculum, na uso si ganito, sinakyan ng DepEd. Ngayon, may matatag curriculum na naman na inilabas at ilo-launch. Nilaunch na. Nilaunch na. <laughs> at hindi pa nga natetest yung success level ni Melks. Heto na si matatag. And then, now, later on, when the EdCom observations come out, will there be a new curriculum to come out again? Eh, kami po ang nagsasuffer sa higher ed kasi the gaps that you are talking about, nakikita ko yung jenge, no? There are gaps, no? Tumataas, tumataas pagdating sa amin, meron pang studyanteng hindi nakakaunawa pag nagbasa. So dito ngayon nagkakaroon din ng problem. How will EdCom address that, sir? Thank you. <clears throat> well, two things. One, kasi we are not, we, what we are doing is complementing DepEd's work. So the revised K-10 is a welcome change because it, we really needed to decongest the K-12 curriculum. Pag tinignan mo po yung competencies, a lot of them, it was too much to teach in such little time. And sometimes, key stage one, two, and three, talagang iba na yung level. Parang mga estudyante mo parang nakatulala na lang. Totoo, tinuturo mo to sa akin. It needed to be fixed. And it is a welcome change that it is now fixed. And then, um, it is decongested in different levels and they have fixed misplaced competencies. Kasi minsan, yung kailangan mo matutunan na prerequisite, nasa fourth quarter, pero tinuro mo yung isang lesson ng second quarter. Inayos yun ng revised K-10. to What we did to support DepEd there was to was we were constructive collaborators or critical collaborators. What we did was to we got teachers, public and private school teachers, to sit down, workshop each subject and grade level, ask them to check, ano ba, tama na ba yung progression nito? decongested na ba ito? Does it focus on the fundamentals? What else needs to be changed or fixed to improve how you will teach it? We submitted all of that to DepEd and asked them, look at this and please make sure that before you issue this new curriculum, it covers this. So we are not going to do something na different sa ginawa ng, iba yung ginagawa ng DepEd, tapos biglang after naman kami, kami din, meron kaming revised 2.0 K-10. <laughs> Hindi po ganun. Kasi, that is not efficient. And that was one of the challenges they faced in the first EDCOM. Na iba yung ginagawa ng EDCOM, iba yung ginagawa ng agencies. We are working closely with DepEd so that we could give them feedback as soon as we get something to share. Um, so yun, I think on ganun naman yung proseso. Ikukwento ko lang, in terms of, you're in teacher ed, tama? In teacher ed, it was funny because in our hearing, in our meeting with PRC, sabi nila, one problem we face is also the changing curriculum. Why? Because yung mga hindi pumasa na graduates ng old curriculum, pag nag-revise sila ng let to conform to the new curriculum, mas hindi pa sila makapasa. Sabi niya, bakit kaya yung mga HEIs hindi daw nag-offer ng bridging programs para sa mga old curriculum na gusto pang mag -retake? para daw makonform yung competencies nila at pumasa na sila. Kasi otherwise, retake sila ng retake ng retake. Pero iba yung inaral nila. So maybe that's an idea to think of and also something that it was the first time for us to hear. Oo nga eh. But, but also, it's also something that HEIs can do eh. Oo. Yes. Are there any more questions? Sige. I think we have one and two. Three. Ah, sige, two na lang daw. <laughs> it's almost 12. Buti po hindi pa kayo nagugutom. Good morning, sir. Edukasyon pa rin po ang iniisip natin. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Good morning po. Morning. Ang question ko, sir, uh, paano po kaya makakatulong ang EDCOM? Kasi kanina binabanggit nyo, there's a learning crisis. And part of that, syempre yung mga teachers at yung mga faculty na nagtuturo no, sa mga learners natin. So paano makakatulong ang EDCOM pagdating sa development ng mga teachers, ng mga faculty, particularly sa HEI. Kasi po, napakalaki ng role 
ng mga teachers natin para sa mga estudyante. Uh, ano po yung mararecommend nyo na dapat development no? ng mga teachers natin ngayon? Kasi dapat po tuloy-tuloy din ang learning ng mga teachers na nagtuturo dun sa mga bata. Thank you very much po. So ma'am, your question is mostly higher ed oriented. No? Yes, sir. When, when I was in chat, and maybe, please keep the mic because babalik ko po yung question sa inyo. Okay, sir. Sige po. When I was in chat, I was handling a lot of the faculty development programs. No, So we started scholarships, master's, PhD. We developed programs with foreign universities that were jointly delivered with a local partner. We partnered with Fulbright to send faculty members abroad. And I think we've sent about 150 already under the Fulbright Chet Scholarships. We also partnered with Sian Spo, LSE, University of London, f to open up opportunities like these. The second one, and was less popular, was externships or industry immersion programs. We were paying faculty to immerse themselves in industry for six months or one semester and giving them very, very huge incentives and allowance, parang 40 or 60,000 per month, if I'm not mistaken. So in other HEIs, higher pa yung nakuha nilang stipend sa amin than yung sweldo nila sa school. But very few people took it. I guess, when, kasi yun yung mga naisip kong higher education development opportunities, no? Scholarships, um, externships, or research. Are there others that you feel is lacking that maybe should be looked into? Uh, okay, sir. Uh, can I speak po for uh, University of Makati? Sure. Yung una pong sinabi niyo, sir, that there are several scholarships grant from CHED. As you know, we got our institutional recognition ah. just recently. So, hindi right. po kami qualified Nakano for doon. that. Okay. okay. okay yeah. Yung second, yung mga private na ino-offer, um, wala po masyado sa amin. So, I, I guess nakatali kasi lahat yun sa CHED before. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's the, that, yeah that was uh, the constraint. So sa ang ang tingin ko sir um, the university no should you know make way for the development of the teachers no or the faculty members kasi nga sila talaga yung nasa baba eh. yung mga teachers yung nagtuturo eh para gumaling yung mga bata dapat mas magaling o pinakamagaling pa yung mga teachers yo kaya yun po yung tanong ko kung ano yung po pwedeng mai-recommend ng Edcom sa mga HEI na, for example, regular HEI lang sila or bago lang sila na na-recognize para po mas ma-improve po ng mga teachers yung trabaho nila at uh, wala na po tayong learning crisis. <laughs> well, I think isa pang, isa pang unexplored thing, you know, in other countries, there's a teaching in higher education module that you need to take. What does it mean? Kasi dito sa Pilipinas, parang it's a controversial thing because there's academic freedom in how you teach. That is what most faculty, at least in UP, parang very strong sila sa ganun when I was there. But in other countries, it's not imposing on you a certain pedagogy, but it's making sure that all teachers, even if you are practitioners or you have, you're more of a researcher, that you have a toolkit that when you teach a lesson, you know that there are different ways of teaching it. For example, pwedeng lecture, pwedeng mas project-based, pwedeng um, case study method, and that you could draw from those uh, toolkits or strategies that are taught to you so that you could teach things differently that's more appropriate to the content that you're going to teach for that lesson. So I guess that's one possibility. Other universities like Ateneo, I think, have started thinking of how th what that might be for themselves for their university, for their students. And that is something, if you feel that you have a very specific niche in terms of programs and pedagogies that you should have access to, baka you could articulate that more clearly in your institution para you make sure that if you're a UMAC faculty, eto kaya, kaya niyo tong gawin. Itong tatlong to, we are excellent in teaching in these three modes because we, we made sure that everyone who comes to UMAC knows these. Parang ganon. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. <laughs> Dr. Nag. Okay. Oh. Dr. Nets po Karyaga. Sure. Sir, good morning once morning. again. Um, I'm Net Karyaga. Um, I was struck by that um, that uh, present no that particular slide 
containing pharmacy. Okay, so that uh, we have we have uh, sh we are short of pharmacy schools to supply pharmacists in the country. Uh, actually, sir, yung 100 na yon naging 124 na okay. na schools. Cool. Now, ang problema po talaga. Uh, sa pharmacy schools or sa pharmacy po na program is we have a dearth of faculty members. Why? Because kailangan unang-una may master's degree bago ka makapag-teach. So that's one. Um, now, sa looks po or local universities, we only have two schools offering pharmacy program. So one is University of Makati and another is Ordaneta City University. So, Kapag nag, ano ka pa po, kapag sa um, uh, public, no? sa, sa, lo sa local university or dito sa University of Makati, ang isa pang requirement po, bago ka makakuha ng full-time faculty would be kailangan may master's degree as required by uh, civil service. Sir, so, um, how, kumbaga, how can we address yung pag-increase ng schools na yon when it comes to the public sector if first and foremost we already have a dearth of qualified faculty members near restraint pa somehow ng CMO and then sa civil service pa bawal pang or hindi pwede makakuha ng full-time faculty member kung wala kang master's degree so, how can we solve yung problema na yon? given, sabi nyo nga sir, na we have universal health care. Actually, that's integrated already in the curriculum of allied health programs to address not just yung lack of doctors, but also other healthcare professionals to come into play para doon sa implementation of the universal health care. So, how can EDCOM help us along that line. Modesty aside, sir, I am the president of the Association of Pharmacy Schools in the country. Could you please write to us containing that problem and then I will refer it to the standing committee so that we could act on it. Okay. Thank I you, was, sir. Yeah, I was in PASUK for their general assembly two weeks ago and kinuwento naman nila that for nursing, they have the same problem. So sa nursing, ang problema naman nila is salary grade. Na yung salary grade ng faculty is mas mababa sa salary grade ng nurses in hospitals. And so wala silang ma-hire. So it's really a matter of pag nag-adjust yung government, nag adjust siya for all, hindi niya naiisip ano bang implication nito sa iba-ibang industriya. And then pagdating sa PRC or the board professions, the, the difficult part is there are the boards. <laughs> and to be honest, there are many boards and there are many similar iterations of this problem. I'm not sure if EDCOM can finish at isa-isahin lahat yun and fix all of that. But we need to prioritize. So sa amin, what are the priority sectors that we need to solve these problems for? And healthcare is clearly one of them and we need to do that. Um, but whether or not we could do it for all, I cannot promise because we only have three years. But we need to do it for healthcare and we should work with DOH to align all of these policies. Kasi hindi talaga nagtutugma ang mga policies ng gobyerno. But I'm surprised that it was... Kasi akala ko it would be CMOs that would define who could teach. But, but bakit CSC? If they teach in a public higher education, the CSC suddenly requires a master's degree. But if even if CHED does not ask for it, parang I don't think it is. Parang let me study it, ha, But it does not seem to be within the the scope of CSC to add to CMOs with CHED determined policies on who could teach in universities, diba? So maybe it's the level. Maybe because iba yung level na mas mataas na and usually CSC asks for it. But anyway, we won't find the answer now. Pero please write to us officially and then we could act on it officially.
Because of the CSC. But how has this been brought up to CSC in the past or CHED? Noted. <clears throat> what what CSC policy is this? Do you have the type, the cir circular number, certificate? What what? Sige. Okay. Okay. But but pero did you bring this up to Ched already and to CSC? What hap what was their response? To Ched because we have a Ched technical panel for pharmacy education. Uh -huh, yes. So we have brought this up. Uh, we were actually uh, like um, um, having this uh, possibility or requesting or suggesting because we have a PharmD degree. So we have schools offering doctor of pharmacy. So it's a two-year, but still it's a professional degree. It's not equivalent to a master's degree. So maaari po ba na kung meron tayong mga graduate na nitong dalawang taon na ito na PharmD, pwede po ba na maging equivalent, or hindi naman siguro pwedeng maging equivalent kasi kahit po sa Philippine Qualifications Framework, hindi equivalent yung PharmD doon sa master's. So pwede po ba na maging flexible somehow doon sa implementation of the CMO na sana makonsider yon para makapag full-time ang isang faculty sa isang local or isang um, SUC. What, did, what was the response? Um, when was that? Uh, it, it's in a public orientation po yun. Um, yeah. Okay. But there was no... There's no official responses. Wala po. Oh, sige. It was just, uh, you know, it was just um, brought into the table for discussion. Oh, sige. Right. Lang po, sir. Please write it to us para we have the documentation and okay. then all of the problems para then we could engage okay. with the agency's concern. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yi. Um, may we now call on stage uh, members of the management committee and uh, may we have the certificate of uh, recognition or appreciation. Sir. Sure. 